umbrella world, pulled together like a closed accordion, locking in the potential to expand in notes of joy, tightly drawn, protectively walk in the rain, squish, squash, I step on a worm. It shouldn't have been on the sidewalk, in my way anyway. I step off, it is lifeless. The same feeling knots inside me, in my umbrella journey, I hardly notice the wet face passing me. After all, it is raining. I do not stop to close the floodgates. That may mean getting wet. I enter my house so perfectly dry, but oh Lord, what a big drip am I. Good, big old Celtic head is, is in frame. Hi everybody online. Happy St. Patrick's Day again. Not that we're filming for the second time. <laughs> no, not at all. So in this gospel passage, Jesus is talking about uh, those who like to gather up wisdom, those who like to gather up knowledge. Uh, in other places, Paul talks about those who want to see signs and miracles, and then and only then will they do Jesus the honor of walking in his footsteps and following him and listening to him. But Jesus retorts very powerfully by saying that there are things that can be known, there are things that can be read, but when it comes to walking with Christ, it's exactly that. It's walking. It's experience. It's actually seeing Christ in you and in the world as you try to walk the path. For those online, Teresa Fox just snuck in super duper late. <laughs> Hi, Teresa. I know she's so mad at me right now. Totally worth it. It's a day of playing tricks. And that is this great missionary to the Irish by the name of St. Patrick. Now, much to the chagrin of all of us of, of Irish descent, um, we have to acknowledge the fact, first and foremost, that Patrick was born in Britain. I know, that hurts. It hurts. It hurts. Kidnapped uh, by the Irish when he was young, forced into indentured servitude, slavery for six years, he would escape, return to his homeland um, after um, going in to, be, to train for some sort of clergy position, some sort of uh, position in the church. He records that he was visited by a very powerful vision, a dream in which a small Irish child called him back, asked him to come and save him and his people from their broken ways. And Patrick would spend the rest of his life going to the land of his captors and sharing with them the gospel, creating fantastic stories of battling evil, dark wizard druids. And, and they would flip them up in the air and they'd spin around and God would slam them into the ground, because as God does. And, and then the, the ground would grow over their feet and that's why there's so many mounds in Ireland. These are the, the defeated druids from the days of Patrick. Talking about times where he would battle against a druid and he would go into, or one of his followers would go into a hut uh, and, and wearing a druid's cloak. And then the druid would wear Patrick's cloak and go into another hut and they'd set the hut on fire and it would burn. And Patrick would walk out unscathed, but the druid's cloak was completely destroyed. Whereas the druid had been burned up, but Patrick's cloak remained untouched by the flames. <gasps> stories of being turned into deer so that angry warlords would not be able to detect them as they wandered through. Whatever your thoughts on such stories, uh, whatever your beliefs on this, what we can say is that in a very rapid amount of time, a lot of people in the place we now call Ireland uh, became Christian. And it is a very, very Christian place to this day, which is why it's so peaceful and not at all torn apart by war and strife. They embrace all forms of Christianity, historically. It's been great. But a, a very important development happened. The, the Celtic church, um, whatever that means, uh, was very instrumental and affects us up into this day. Because on the place we now call Western Europe, barbarian hordes started to overwhelm Rome. Rome collapsed. It's the beginning of what we as historians hate, but is popularly known as the Dark Ages. However, in Ireland, uh, which had escaped all such barbarian invasions given its location, Irish monks and scribes were doing beautiful illuminated manuscripts. They were copying the Bible. They were copying all sorts of works of Western Christendom. They believed that was part of their spiritual duty. And so many of the books and ideas that were lost in Western Europe were saved and maintained in Ireland. These were very, based on Patrick, these were very missionary-driven people. They, they set up 
um, places like Iona, Lindensfarne, and all sorts of sister and daughter communities all throughout what we now call the United Kingdom. They had a very pronounced and, and successful missionary endeavor that lasted for generations. And, uh, and Darlene, funnily enough, earlier called me, Professor, Professor, so now you're going to get a five-minute history lesson. And all God's people said, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, here we go. What I want to talk about today and then wrap up with is that in about the 660s, a king by the name of Oswiu uh, was in Northumbria, parts of present-day England. And there was a debate going on between how the Roman church understood how you date Easter, we're coming into Holy Week, this is important, and how the Celtic people had been traditionally dating Easter. Now, there were multiple schools of thought. I'm not going to bore you, bog you down with this sort of stuff, but there's multiple schools of thought on how Christians were supposed to figure out when Easter was. For quite a while, they just, they just followed the Jewish uh, tradition of Passover and to Easter right around the same time. But as things went on, it became more and more the arguments of more and more leaders that Easter should always fall on a Sunday. We should celebrate the resurrection of Jesus on a Sunday. And so this required people, very type A people, no offense to my type A people, we need you to, to function. But a job or a task like this was greeted with much aplomb as they tried to figure out all sorts of numbers to calculate how we're going to do this. And like all things, it went smoothly and peacefully and everybody agreed and it all went along. No. Of course, different people came to different understandings. And a lot of people in the Celtic realms, up in places like Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England, had been dating it for a certain way, based on the tradition of Patrick, and then Columbus, and all sorts of other uh, Celtic missionaries. And, and, this is very, very important, they also cut their hair differently. They had a different, what's called a tonsure. So when a monk would shave, you know the little, the donut that they go around here. Well, I think the Irish or the Celts had it sort of shaved at the back here. It, whatever, it doesn't matter. But at some point in the 600s, Pope Gregory sent some missionaries from Rome up to these areas, and, and the conflict between these two various schools of, of thinking came to a head uh, in Northumbria at a thing called the Senate of Whitby. Now, at the Senate of Whitby, the king wanted to know which of these schools it was he was going to uh, have in his realm because his queen celebrated Easter on one day, and he celebrated another day. Which means at some point, there were people from different factions celebrating Easter, while the other people were still in Lent. It was awkward. It was problematic. And so he wanted one sort of universal calendar. And so, I want to make sure I get the names right. It's Wilfred, and Coleman. One of the missionaries on the Celtic side by the name of Coleman, and then Wilfred on the Roman side, met together in the king's court with the king saying, I will make the final decision. And it all boiled down to this very key point. Coleman was able to point back all the way to Patrick, all the great Celtic saints that the king himself had benefited from. All, places like Lindensfarne and Iona, all these great understandings of the gospel that were centuries old at this point. Very, very compelling. He could trace how he believed and what he taught all the way back to show that he was uh, venerating them right and the direction they're going in was correct. On the other side, Wilfred, on the Roman side, was able to point all the way back to saints Peter and Paul because he was from Rome, the great Pope, the great Papa. And as such, could not really challenge anything. If, if, if Rome says it, it must be so. And so the king, at the end of all this sort of stuff, had one simple question and asked Coleman on the Celtic side, is it true that Peter is the rock upon which Christ said he would build his church? And is it true that Peter holds the keys to the gates of heaven? To which our Celtic friend had to say, yeah, that's true. And the king said, well, that's it. I side with the guy who can let me into heaven. And this is an example of Rome winning the gay against somewhat of a Celtic church. How much of a Celtic church existed before that is, is up for debate. But I bring this in as an example of another ways in which Christians, for all the right reasons, for all the silly reasons, do love to systematize stuff. And we do need to systematize stuff. I have, as we've discovered today and multiple occasions beforehand, uh, an almost spiritual level gift of the inability to know where I am at any given time. I have zero internal compass, much to my father's eternal chagrin. You've all seen me get lost to places that I've been to many times, including some of your homes. Places I've been to many times, I still need directions. I don't know what it is. 
My favorite example is just to say that when God decided to make me, he's like, he'll remember all these books and never have any idea where he is in the physical world. Why? Because it's funny, good enough for me. But the systemizing is, is required because people need to know how to get from A to B. We need to function on these different things. Dichotomies, rules, schedules do help. They bring benefit, order, and structure to our lives. And so the natural in, in, desire is to also put that into our spiritual lives. And this is where sometimes it works and sometimes we have problems. Because we have given and been given the idea for, for 2,000 years now that there is a right way to do this. And of course, there is. There's a wrong way to do this, and of course there is. The tricky part comes in is somehow, sometimes, the people who've told us what is right had other reasons, other purposes. It is good that we celebrate Easter basically at the same time. It is not as important that people cut their hair the same way. And while we can look at things like that and think they're silly, there's also many of you that grew up here that men have to cut their hair short. Men are not allowed to have long hair. Many of you have rebelled against it. Many seminaries and Bible colleges through the 60s and the 70s uh, refused, they, they told their young men that they were not allowed to grow beards or long hair. Even though you look around at pictures of Jesus and what does Jesus have? A beard, long hair, exactly. So sometimes these rules and these systems become very oppressive. They become problematic. They no longer do what they're originally established to do. And this Senator Whitby is one of those examples. There was no way for two differing, I wouldn't even say competing, different ways of understanding God and following Christ in that part of the world. They were not allowed to, to mutually live together. One had to triumph over the other. And I don't say had to because I believe that. I say had to because that was the thinking of the time. And whatever our reasons are, we have to be very, very careful because many of us have inherited a lot of these ideas that this is the right way to do it. This is how it has to be done in order to whatever honor God. And one of the major reasons why I constantly push you, constantly challenge you, constantly navigate doing things differently is because I don't want any of us, myself included, to fall into the trap of thinking the way we do it is the right way to do it. It's good for us. And because we know each other, it's also important that we remain Flexible, open, because I will say this, true worship, true worship does not reside in the structures, the forms, when we say prayers, how we say, how we sing, when we sing, what instruments we use, what we do this, how we do that, how we dress. These are things that help us. These are things that inform our identity and they're fun. True worship always requires, if we are to believe Jesus, it's not about gathering of wisdom, it's not just about the gathering of knowledge, it's not looking for signs and all our prayers to be answered. It's walking the path with our Lord. And that's tricky, because we cannot see or hear our Lord. So the closest we've got is each other. The trust that Darlene knows Christ and can show me something about Christ. That Stella knows Christ and can show me something about Christ. That Neil knows Christ and can show me something about Christ. That those who are watching this online have people in their life who know Christ and can show them Christ. And we walk with each other. And so we're left with what is true worship? Is it the Catholic version? Is it one of the Orthodox versions? Is it one of the Protestant versions? And there's been many, many fights, especially, and I said this tongue in cheek, in places like Ireland, where different versions of the faith were very, very willing for many, many years to kill each other for a whole variety of social and political reasons that had nothing to do with Christ, even though the churches were heavily involved. Worship, true worship, requires sacrifice. It's not a comfortable thought, but that's it. We have to be willing to give up what we think is the way things should be done. In the name of Christ, and in the blessing of being with each other. True worship always requires sacrifice financially, if we support the church, but also in your day-to-day -day life. We don't get to be racist. We don't get to be greedy. We don't get to be angry in ways that are harmful. We get to have anger and see that as part of our experience and our walk with God. But we don't get to 
exclude other people because they're not doing something the way we're doing. And so while many of us are wearing green, it is such a beautiful, wonderful, silly way to look at that those who are not are just as much a part of this community on St. Patrick's Day as anybody and anywhere else. We don't get to be divisive because that's not our Christ. And the more we walk the path with him, the more we get to see and experience the blessing and the benefit of being hospitable, gracious, open, and loving. That whether we shave our hair in the halo or have some weird skullet thing, we see both as a reflection of Christ. However we understand the world, we can engage and walk with each other, share with each other, and be with each other. We get to enjoy the young and what they bring and teach us about Christ and those of us who are older and the wisdom and the insights they can bring about Christ. The missionary endeavor, and this is what I'll close with, has come under much flack in this present age, uh, many of it, much of it for good reason. The idea that Christians know more than the people they came to evangelize. In many instances, it very quickly and easily slid into arrogance and superiority. A superiority that was balanced uh, and strengthened by industry, weapons, and a, and a lack of regard for other people. This is why we read from the First Nations version, because the story of Christianity in Canada is incredibly important, and especially when you talk about First Nations, the Métis, Inuit, and their response. So I read books like Rescuing the Gospel from the Cowboys, looking at the ways in which certain understandings of Christ, certain understandings of this world have been dismissed, have been cast aside, have been actively targeted. We, for all the benefit, and never forget, dictatorships are efficient. Having one or two voices have all the power is efficient. We'll all get things done a lot quicker, as long as, and it's fine, if the voice on the top happens to agree with your voice. The problem is, obviously, when the way you see the world is not considered valuable, then a dictatorship becomes heinous, brutal, uh, unlivable. So, if we walk with Christ, we must acknowledge, honor, and I dare say even protect those who are trying to figure out Christ from another perspective. Can we be open enough? Can we be brave enough to accept ideas that may seem foreign to us because the person with them we see as greater than the idea? We need structures, I get that. But the problems with worship and structures is that the arrogance and the power for all the right reasons can actually take us away from Christ. So on this celebration of St. Patrick, a very successful missionary, someone who brought Christianity to all sorts of parts of the world that we've all benefited from. Let us remember this beautiful, humble prayer that began our service, and I'll close this off with. From his Confessio, St. Patrick just says, So, I am first of all a simple country person. Those of us who attend Mount Spring and Westover are also simple country pe people. I'm a refugee, and I'm unlearned. I do not know how to provide for the future. But this I know for certain, that before I was brought low, I was like a stone lying deep in the mud. Then he who is powerful came up in mercy and pulled me out, lifted me up and placed me at the very top of the wall. And that is why I must shout aloud in return to the Lord for such great good deeds of his here and now and forever, which this human mind cannot measure. Let us remember that we are simple, unlearned country folk. And if we end up on the top of the wall, it's not because we're doing it right. It's because in our humility, God placed us there. And from that humility, we walk forward with Christ to see Christ, both of the people we're walking with and the places we have not yet gone to. Our God is through the whole world. And one of the ways in which we forget that is assuming that we are there to bring people Jesus, rather than how can we walk and see what Jesus has already been doing before he got there. Make sense? Okay. All right. True worship requires sacrifice. And that's why we're bringing a whole bunch of stuff next week for Palm Sunday. Yay. All right. Amen, amen.